Hi guys. Good afternoon. How are you? Excellent. We're awesome. How are you doing? How are you this doing? is fun. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoy this. Yeah, excellent. We won't talk about English football or Arsenal. Did they? <laughs> what happened today? No, no, no. It's the international. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. yeah. International break. Come missed, on, pal. I haven't missed. Well, look, my team's in the championship. Uh, you know, I'm a Newcastle fan. Uh, uh, Manchester United. It's okay. okay. It's all right. Yeah. Andy Lee. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to be a Man U fan. <laughs> not, not as much. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not playing in the Champions League. No, that's true. They're playing all. Europa, right? But anyway. Let's talk about the show and not soccer. <laughs> I love soccer. Let's talk about the show. Uh, have any of you had a chance to view any of the episodes? I watched yeah, the first episode a few times. Great. <laughs> really good. Good. Really good. Good, good. It was awesome. You have to look at it. There were clues and things I picked up on the second time. Yep. Yes, Turn that's around. what we like to hear. It's worth watching again. Mm. You know, exactly. we, the show unabashedly treats the audience as intelligent. Mm -hmm. You know, we are 100%. You're a smart audience. You've seen a million shows and movies. You don't want to be spoon fed. You're excited for the idea that you have to engage. You don't want to fold your laundry during this show. You want to watch like you'd watch a movie. And that's our point of view. And we are. We make no bones about it. We say we are like a movie. You know, we're the type of people we want you to engage. We want you to have questions. We want you to, to watch closely. And then really, we want you to go on Reddit and talk to your friends. Yeah. Um, and convince them to watch the show because then you have more people to talk to. I think that's actually a very refreshing approach to a new program. I mean, why, what, what was the inspiration for that? Are you tired of uh, the popcorn uh, no, hour long flick? Or? I think it started because Henry and I were both guys and we were writing television, but we both wanted to write movies. And we had a mutual love of a lot of cinematic references, and we sort of felt that good television was moving in a cinematic direction. And this is back in 2006. When we right. started this process, so, yeah. I mean, we were looking at Sopranos. We looked sort of Sopranos in the wire, and we said, oh, they're doing early 70s cinema. This was what was happening in 1972, when you had, just after the French Connection, The Godfather, and Dog Day Afternoon. That's what the Sopranos era is. Mm -hmm. What's next? The next era is to take that and add a bit of magic. Take all those, those great character stories, and then add that other layer of, I don't know the word for it, the magic, but I think Game of Thrones has it, I think Westworld has it, and I think we have it, and I think Robot has it. Yeah. These are shows that, if you look at their storytelling style, we are a show that is really grounded in character, but the world is fantastical. Mm -hmm. But the character motivations are always the principal drive. The principal drive of the show is not what the mystery is in the end. I'm going to tell you the entire mystery by the end of the first season. You will know how this universe works, what the mythology is, and yet I can tell another story in that universe because the universe itself is interesting. Right. So if you look at you know Game of Thrones, okay, you define the world. Now what do the people do? That's where people really want to go with television is it's about what do the people do, but the universe itself can have rules that aren't strictly, you know, grounded in reality. And that's the next generation of television, and that's cinematic. You know, I don't have a bunch of time with Westworld, but yeah. Juan Carlos Fresnadillo found a way to sort of, you know, split the atom, and By the, the show looks phenomenal. Well, how many, have you only seen the first episode? Because right I'm now, four are available. To critics four on my seat. Online. Oh, okay. Possibly five. Yes. So you can get we'll further episodes. Them, yeah. Yeah. Are, you, are you talking about Falling Water? Or yeah. Falling Water? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so and and the interesting thing is, I mean, just to give you an idea, since you know how many days, like, you know, Game of Thrones gets 23 plus days to shoot, we shoot in seven and a half days. Oh, wow. And I think that the visual, you know, and the complexity of the characters that are drawn, it's a real, real kudos to yes. and, and, and Blake directed the, the finale. Yeah. How have you managed that? I mean, is it... The production it's, team is that saying that? We have a ridiculous production team. We Scott Murphy, our production right. designer, we right. shoot in New York. Um, we do cross border two episodes at a time, but the biggest thing is really going in, the scripts are visual by their very nature, um, they're, and they're short. Uh, I mean, for example, the you know editor's cuts are always long, but on the finale, the script was 39 pages, and the, the editor's cut was 70 minutes. <laughs> um, so much of what happens does happen in these little eighth of the page bursts, but we take the time for it. And then in the editing room, we're not like cut to the dialogue. We're like take the time, let the audience, let the show wash over people. You know, there's a, there's a decent amount of David Lynch in what we do, which is yes. we want it to wash over you. The sound design is such a huge part of the show. You know, there's a sequence in episode three, which we shot in six hours and took four hours to sound mix. Um, the layers of sound when you get into the dreaming world, because we need the dreams to feel different from reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the reality, we, we're not trying to trick the audience, but what we want to do is, is teach the audience that it's an immersive, fluid dynamic between those two states of being. Especially for these characters. These characters exactly. These powerful dreamers. 
that in our universe, there's no real and not real. Everything's real. There's just dreaming and waking. And what our characters are discovering and what the viewers will discover on that journey is the idea that the line between the, the Venn diagram of sleeping and waking kind of goes like this as an overlap section. And that's where weird and stuff happens. that's why happens. it's called falling water. <laughs> because it's a permeable membrane. The idea we came up with the, the metaphor of water, which mm -hmm. is something like if you think of a waterfall, it's like a wall, but you can reach through it. You can sense what's on the other side without seeing it. And yet you can also pass through it. And so that's what our people are doing. They're passing through the falling water to the other side to the dreaming state. Why did USA seem like the correct network to air the show? I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. When we had to set up all our meetings and they said USA, I wasn't sure. And then I discovered Mr. Robot. And I was like, oh, you know that's what, what they want to be. Ultimately, networks, networks are really made up of people. Mm -hmm. And and networks of profile changes as people you know rise within the organization. And um, you know the, the early advocate for this is uh, Alex Sepiel, who is the early advocate for Mr. Robot. And you know when you when you when you put all your chips out uh -huh. on a show like Mr. Robot and it works, and it works. you get to do it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we were blessed enough yeah. to be the second one. And exactly. it's also timing too, because as if it, if, yes. the Emmys are a good example. Yep. Basically, now there's representation for this type of um, th these type of shows. Yes. Absolutely. Now folks will start looking at it and start appreciating it more and start looking yeah. at it when it comes in. Exactly. Comes on. I took a look at the pilot myself, and then I looked at, and then I sat with my wife. And I said, "This is something you need to sit down and watch." And that's pretty much how I'm going to pitch it to my friends. Also, it's like you need to sit down and really watch yes. it and to get get the first get the first episode. And there's so much to try to figure out. Now, when you started thinking about storyboarding, for example, yeah. and you, some of the dream sequences were mind-bending. Yeah. And, and it's not a procedural story. So when you first sit, sat down and figured this out back in 2006, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. now you... I didn't know how we were going to run people down with a bus. <laughs> I thought what we'd do is we'd probably have dummies on a street and all that. And then Juan, actually, Juan was so smart, he said, you can't leave the bus. You can't leave the dreamer. Mm -hmm. That was one of the, sort of the goals of the visual language is his experience and my experience is you dream in first person essentially. So what we wanted to do is put the camera on the shoulder of the dreamer. So like if I was shooting a dialogue scene in a dream and two people talks in dreams and I was the dreamer and you were visiting my dream, the camera on your shot would be here and the camera on my shot would be here because it's my dream. So the perspective of everything is from where I am. And so what's fun is when our two characters meet, then you get that moment where they cross over and it's fun like that. In terms of story, I kind of don't worry how I'm going to do it. I just sort of, I figure it out and, and I trust that, we'll, that I have a production team that does it. I mean, we created so many, we created everything from like a 1970s record album to our own cell phone. We had to create the billboard cell phones, mm -hmm. and which is great. You know, we've got all this stuff that we built ourselves and Scott Murphy, our production designer, and Juan and everybody. I mean, just, I mean, just if just you amazing. saw the, the new trailer that we just released, I mean, it, it just came out this afternoon, I think. Um, you know, the sleep lab, what the sleep lab looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. And that was, and we ended up, the, the sleep lab is instead of being some dank building, it's actually up in the top of this tall building with views forever, because Juan said to me, well, when you sleep, you have to be in the sky. You have to be in the clouds. And so there's a metaphorical language to the visual choices. And one of the things I, uh, that also appeals to me is, is the diversity of the cast. Yes. The one thing is, and sometimes I look at shows for the, I look at for shows when they start piling out, and I start figuring out, okay, who's on here, and then is this something that appeals to me? Well, I say Asian, so basically, this is the first thing I say, okay. And then I started looking at this show, and I said, wait a minute, this is not really a procedural or stereotypical when it looks at it. And then I really started looking at how Will was playing this character, and I said, you know what? You there are no roundhouse eyes. kicks or kung fu in exactly. the whole in the whole you series. You close your eyes and basically say, you know what? This is not an Asian person. This is a regular family man who's taking care of his mother. It's a New York person. cop. Yeah, it's yeah. a New York cop. You look at it; it's not basically force feeding a diversity aspect. It's basically saying this is a normal person He's taking care of his mother. So it's character bound. It's I, not stereotypical or, or you say, you know what? Let's get this one person in there. So I, I give you kudos on that. Thank we you didn't start much. out trying to write diversity. What we tried to write was New York, to be honest. And New York is where everybody comes. Yes. So, um, you know, the uh, Burton character, uh, David Ajula plays, um, that wasn't written to be black and British.
British. That was written. Well, it was written to be Richard Burton. So, um, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it was you know. It, well, he's also the next James Bond, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but David Wouldn't just it? not really. Don't don't think that they've just got a tip. <laughs> no, no. It, 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 it's, it's my own dream for him. It's, I, that's my joke with him is that he's going to be Bond. Um, but we just set out to cast the best actor, and we opened it up. We weren't looking for a white guy. We just said, who's the best actor? And that's how we ended up with David. I mean, with Will, uh, we wrote the part um, to be Korean, uh, sort of half Korean, half Japanese, because we were sort of interested by it, and also because we'd read a lot of Haruki Murakami. And not to Murakami, because the right. inspiration for this is... A lot of his books. Murakami, if you haven't read his novels, it's fantastic. But what we decided is, I wrote it like it's a New York cop. That's all I did. You know, it's I didn't, I didn't want to... Because we have a, a transgender member of the cast, but literally when I wrote it, I said, you know, this character is transgender. The fact that uh, she is transgender will never be brought up in any context ever. That's the fucking point. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Is that people aren't defined by their gender, their race. They're defined by who they are as people. And so, in fact, the most progressive statement I can make is to have, you know, a reoccurring character who is transgender, who nobody comments at all. And it's not a big deal. It's not their defining trait. Their defining trait is who they are within the, the context of the show. And to me, that is the most progressive way to approach this from a point of view where, look, I'm a privileged, white, rich, Jewish guy. I am the least diverse person in the history of the world. Um, except, except your family, like my family, had to change their name because true. they were so discriminated against <laughs> and couldn't get jobs. But so. it's, you know, so, no, I'm not going to be the person who can... But, but I, I we wish humanity. David was here because he's incredibly well-spoken. I don't know if you were told, but he's starring in the West End in London. Mm -hmm. uh, he's playing Jim Brown in One Night, uh, One Night in Miami, which is about the night when he was still Cassius Clay. Mm -hmm. Cassius Clay being um, Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston. Mm -hmm. And instead of going out of the town, he got together with Sam Cooke, Malcolm X, and Jim Brown. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to London to see the play. Excellent. But that's what that's why he couldn't be. Understood. And, and, and I think also with Double Trend is that some of the actors do stage and other production in the meantime. So yeah. number one, thank you very much for thank you very New much. York as one well, of the uh, as a backdrop for this great series. And that best was, luck that, that, was that was a fight. That was a fight. Is uh, this a show thank you. Thank you. because you want them to go on Reddit and you want to talk to your friends about it, you want to unpack it, is this something that you would discourage people from binge watching? Oh no no no. Oh, I'm happy to have look I just want Consume you to watch. Consume however you want. I think, you know, I what I would love is everybody who didn't doesn't start watching the beginning who gets turned on binges it up to the point that they want to binge it. That's what I really want. I want you to want to binge it and I, to get your once a week cookie because the, the fun thing about that is then you can have a conversation with your friends. I, there's something about the once a week format once people get excited about a show that there's this I can't wait a moment. I can't wait to get on my friends. I can't wait to live tweet it. And we, I love that experience. I mean, that's the way I approach making television. Is I want to make shows that I want to watch and I want to experience them the way I like to experience them. And of course I want the next episode. But sometimes that delayed gratification makes it that much more fun. <laughs> so please, binge away. Did you have a question? Sure. Um, talking about social media, so it's such a great story for like, you know, fan interaction. What are you looking forward to most about the fan reactions of the show? Well, quite honestly, I would love to find a way to create an Instagram feed where people basically make like little photographs to of, the, of what they thought they dreamed last night. Like, you know, somebody would use Legos or Barbie dolls or, you know, the sun or whatever. And they would basically Instagram to Back to the Fall and everything, this was my dream last night. And I would love the idea that fans start sharing their dreams with each other. That to me would be like, not only do they love this world, they want to be a part of this world and they're actually engaging with each other because they, in the way, in that sort of connectivity way. And up until that time, um, there's going to be launching very soon, we're trying to get it right, gooddreamer.com, which is a dream interpretation um, site where you can put in your dreams and there will be a fairly rudimentary but analysis along with visuals. Will this be tied in with the series? Yes. Or, or, yes. Okay, yeah. great. Um, yeah, so gooddreamer.com. If you go to the website for the show... Um, at USA Network.com. I think they yeah. kick you. You can kick that, yeah, but you can also go to goodreamer.com. Is when it's a live link, will be a live link. From there. Yeah, and I think that should be launching in the next couple of months. And kind of, what do you think about the series that's going to draw the viewers? Oh, the universality of dreaming and the emotions of these characters. I mean, the fun is for all the the surrealism and the wonderful dreams and reality that the emotional journeys of these characters are so primal. I mean, I don't know, I have two kids, the idea of a lost child. Um, I have women in my life who've left my life
wife, the idea of a lost lover, the idea of wanting to somehow bond with one's parent, one's maybe absentee parents. Um, these are really universal drives, and then so the world itself is fabulous and wonderful to wander around in. But the real emotional through it line of these characters comes back to that. really That's will really pull people what's through. Driving them. They get caught up in this mystery, and as as Blake said, I know you were right, Blake. You know, the, we will actually everyone will know what's going on by the end of the first season. So it's not like people that will keep continue to try to you know come up with obscure you know ways to keep things a mystery. But what's driving everything is these needs and desires. 